I hate crime. Things had been pretty quiet for a few days. My office in the federal building became a place where I filed bills and played solitaire. But then one morning, just as I'd half decided to beat it down to a certain pub, the case of the chamois bag and what was in it started. Larry, it is you. Well, of all the guys in the world, Bill Kerr. How are you, Private Eye? Bill Kerr was a guy who'd spent a couple of years in the islands with me. He has six bullet holes in his leg to prove it. He was a yank with short cropped hair, clean cut features and a smile that you had trouble rubbing off. But the smile wasn't so noticeable anymore. It's been five years, Larry. Yeah. How long have you been out here? Since three months after I was discharged at San Diego. How did you find me? I picked up a phone book looking for a guy named Kendall. And there was your name. <laughs> Larry Kent, private investigator. I couldn't believe it. Now, what made you leave the state? It's a long story. Any women in it? One or two. Maybe I'll tell you about it sometime. How about uh, going over to the pub for a drink, huh? No, thanks. Larry, this isn't exactly a pleasure call. I'm glad to see you again, but... But I've got things on my mind. Uh-huh. You want to spill it? Sure. First, have a look at these. He took out a small chamois bag and loosened the string around the neck of it. Then carefully, he spilled three black marbles on my desk. Pearls, Larry. The rarest of them all. Black pearls. <whistles> nice, Boy. huh? Yeah. Are they real? Well, if they aren't, I've killed a guy for nothing. Well, I think you've got me wrong. I was a pretty cold-hearted guy on the islands, maybe, but now I'm a private eye. I've got ideals. I don't give protection. Relax, or... Larry, relax. I'm on the up and up, too. Just a minute, I'll tell you the whole story. He started. Bill, after arriving in Australia in 1946, met a few characters in Melbourne. They told him a beautiful yarn about the thousands you could make in the purling racket. Well, Bill had some money, so the three of them got together, went to Broome, bought a lugger, and were in business. Yeah, the first three were tough, kid. We found some pearls. Yeah. But only enough to keep us going. Then, not six months ago, one of our divers brought up an oyster that held one of these little beauties. Well, he stayed in that area for a month, ending up with the three of them you see on your desk. One for each of you, huh? Yeah. That's the way I had it figured. But not that jerk Dempsey and Yarkis. First it was Dempsey. He took the pearls one night. Yarkis and I found him in the morning on the road, 50 miles out of Broome. He pulled a gun on me, but I was quicker. Uh-huh. And Yarkis? Yeah, he tried it a week later, but he didn't use the road. I caught up with him in the desert. I pull it, put a bullet through him and left him there for the dingoes. You said you killed one man. That's all, Larry. Somehow Yarkis lived through it. I saw him last night. But I lost him in a crowd. He's gunning for me, Larry. Well, you'd better go to the cops, Bill. And maybe have to explain, Dempsey? Uh, uh no thanks. Hmm, yeah. Well, what are you going to do? I've got an appointment with a fellow at his office tomorrow. He might buy the pearls. But in the meantime, just in case Yarkis gets too close to me, I want you to hold him for me. Well, what do I do if something happens to you? Use your own judgment, Larry. Okay. Okay, Bill. Can I get you by phone? Yeah, yeah, at my hotel. Here, here, I'll give you a number. He scrolled out the phone number of the hotel, and we made arrangements to meet at the corner of the GPO and George Street at 11 the next morning. We shook hands. I wished him luck, and he left. I put the chamois bag in my pocket, and then I did my best to forget about it. But I couldn't. They seemed to weigh a ton. It made me nervous, so I... Stopped for a few hours at a pub, and then I went home. At about nine o'clock, I got the bright idea of phoning Bill Kerr. The clerk at his hotel rang the room phone, but there was no answer. Then I tried to sleep. I couldn't. So 15 minutes later, 
After I dodged the hotel clerk, I stood at the door of Bill's room. There was no light inside the room and no sounds. I took out my skeleton keys and on the sixth one... I felt for the switch and froze. Somebody had turned the room inside out. The mattress on the bed had been torn to pieces. The bed post pulled apart. The carpet pulled from the floor. Even the curtains were ripped down. But that wasn't what froze me. It was a handle. The handle of the knife that was stuck in Bill Kerr's back. <laughs> One look at him was enough. The guy who did it was an artist. With a knife, anyway. But he wasn't satisfied with just killing Bill. He'd pulled the clothes from his body and searched them for the pearls. The pearls? I figured I'd better get out of there. I didn't go. I hit the floor. The guy who took the punch shot went down the stairs. I got up and followed, but I didn't have a chance to nail him. When I reached the street, the guy was climbing into a car that moved before he was all the way in. I put my gun back in my pocket and got out of there before the cops arrived. I didn't want to answer any embarrassing questions. Then I had a good night's sleep, and in the morning I went to the office as usual. Well. Hello. Good morning. The sign on your door said, walk in. So I did it. When I had that sign put on the door, I must have been thinking of dames like this one. She had platinum blonde hair that was real. Everything about her was real. Right down to the diamonds on her fingers. She was the kind of a dame who'd make life on a desert island a picnic. Yeah, and you'd shoot the first guy who tried to rescue you. We went through the usual preliminaries. Her name was Amanda Martin, and she wanted me to do a job for her. I'm giving a party tonight. I'd like you to be a sort of bodyguard for my friend's jewelry. And yours too, huh? Yes. What kind of a party is this, a, a society affair? Oh, no. You see, most of my friends are bookmakers, and their wives and fiancés, of course. Yeah. Will you accept the assignment? Tonight, eh? Huh? Who recommended me to you, Miss Martin? <laughs> you don't need a recommendation. She flashed a lovely set of her own teeth and my blood pressure went up to danger level. She said she'd like me to call at her place at six, two hours before the guests arrived. I took the job. I couldn't refuse even though I was still worrying about the black pearls. She gave me a Potts Point address, pulled a very lucky little dead mink around her shoulders, and left me thinking some very nice thoughts. At ten minutes to six that evening, I parked my car two blocks away from her address. Then I started to walk. It was a dark street full of shadows. But there were two shadows that moved. As I watched, they moved behind a brick wall. I kept walking. When I was ten feet from the wall, I took my gun out and stopped. Like a guy would to light a cigarette. I even flicked a lighter in my left hand. The shadows came out again. One had a gun in its hand. It didn't use it. The other one took one look, vaulted the wall and ran. I caught him on somebody's lawn and grabbed him in a one-armed tackle. We went down together. I rolled over and saw the flesh of a knife. He didn't use that either. I fished through his pockets and took his wallet. Then I headed for the tall timber without bothering to call on my client. I didn't want to guard her jewelry. I was having enough trouble with my own. Just to be safe, instead of going to my flat that night, I stayed at an hotel. While there, I I looked through the knife handler's wallet. His name was Joe Yarkus. Yarkus, one of Bill's ex-partners. 
and probably the guy who knifed Bill. In the morning, I went back to my flat. Ha! Huh. It was just as I figured. The place was torn to ribbons. I didn't go in. I took the pearls out of my pocket, hid them where no one would think of looking, and then I went to see my landlady. And what is it this time, Mr. Kent? Well, it's my flat, Mrs. Uh... Oh, I know, I know. It's cold. Everybody's complaining. But I can't afford to fix the hater. If you want it fixed, fix it yourself. Sorry, I, I don't belong to the right union. But it's not the heater this time, it's the whole flat. Somebody was looking for something and they took everything apart trying to find it. And not again? Yeah. I just thought I'd let you know. <laughs> well, I didn't know you had a sense of humor. Oh, I can afford to laugh. I had the whole place insured last week. <laughs> well, that'll give you an idea of how much chance you've got with your landlady. Well, she said she'd have the place fixed up as soon as she could. So I started to go to the office. I only reached the street. Hold on, Kent. Well, hello, Inspector. Got your gun handy? Yeah. Let me have it. Why? You might be under arrest. The Inspector sat me in his office and gave me the Australian equivalent of the third degree. Where were you last night? On business. Hot's point? Yeah, I might as well admit it. I'm glad you did. Because the bullets we found in two dead men will undoubtedly match your gun. How do you figure that? The bodies were found only a few doors away from a house owned by a Miss Amanda Martin. She hired you to do a job last night and you didn't turn up. Two and two make four, Kent. Oh, your arithmetic is improving, uh, but uh, you're not holding me, are you, Inspector? That was self-defense. One guy had a gun, the other had a knife. Yes, I know. What's it all about, Larry? I haven't got the slightest idea. Now, look here, Kent. If you think you can go on obstructing justice, Justice! You... Inspector, people are trying to knock me off. I think that's my business. Are you going to hold me or aren't you going to hold me? Get out of here. Thanks. Maybe I'll get in touch with you later on. Never mind that. Stay where we can get in touch with you. In other words, don't leave Sydney. Don't worry, I won't. Unless I have to chase somebody. After I left headquarters, I did some thinking. I tried to figure out why Amanda Martin turned me in. I knew the police had asked questions in the neighborhood after the shooting. They always do. Then I thought about the two guys who tried to stop me so close to her place. As the inspector said, two and two make four. Yes? The guy who opened the door was short, fat, bald, and greasy. Across his vest was a gold watch chain and a gravy stain. He wore thick bifocals. I told him who I was. Larry Kent. Weren't you supposed to come here last night? That's right. I, uh, I want to apologize to Miss Martin for not showing up. Yes, by all means. Uh, Miss Martin's in the living room. It was a nice shack. Her friends must have been bookmakers. And they must have been very good friends. I followed the short guy. I wasn't going to let anybody get behind me. Amanda looked up from a magazine as we entered the room. Mr. Kent. Hello. Sorry about last night. Oh, that's quite all right. I'd like you to meet a very good friend of mine, John Plant. How do you do, Mr. Kent? He put out his hand. I took it. He pulled me towards him. Oh! He hit me with his left. As I went back, he let me have it again. Oh. Uh, I don't know how much time had passed before I came to. I was sitting in a chair. Plant was standing in front of me. All right, Kent. Where are the pearls? 
What pearls? Don't play dumb. I don't know what you're talking about. Why didn't you come here last night? Two guys tried to stop me. After I took care of them, I, I didn't want any more work for the evening. Kent, I want those pearls. <sighs> what makes you think I have any pearls? Bill Kerr went to see you. Then later, when we searched Kerr's hotel room, the pearls he had when he arrived in Sydney were nowhere to be found. Kerr was an American. So are you. What did you do with the pearls he gave you? He didn't give me any. Ah, talk. Ah. Sure, sure, I can talk till I'm blue in the face, but I... I can't tell you anything about any pearls because I don't know anything about them. Uh, You'll uh, talk. There are ways to make you talk. I didn't doubt that he knew them either. He stood there for a few minutes, looking at me. Then he called out. Amanda! Amanda, come in here. What, what is it, John? Here. My gun. Hold it on Kent while I tie him in the chair. There are some old Chinese torches I want to do just a little research on. He gave her the gun while he went to a cupboard and brought out some rope. Then he made me stand up while he tied my ankles to my wrists. Uh, finally, he pushed me back into the chair. Yeah. That'll hold you very well, I think. But watch him anyway, Amanda. I'll take no chances this time. You're a real nice kid, Amanda. Oh, yes. You mind telling me what those two guys were supposed to do with me? If it will entertain you. They were merely looking for the pearls. If they found them on me? Who knows what might have happened. And if they didn't find them? Then you would have been in much the same position as you are now. Yeah. That's what I figured. You tried a good ambush, but it didn't work. No matter. You walked into another trap. Uh-huh. Yeah, with my eyes wide open. I didn't know your fat little friend could move so fast. But there's another thing on my mind. Why did you turn me into the cops? Merely so you'd be in the custody of the police when we... Searched your office this morning. Oh, so you turned that inside out too, huh? Tough luck I didn't have it insured. There's only one kind of insurance you should be worrying about. She smiled. But it wasn't the warm smile she'd given me the day before. I leaned back, tried to relax as well as I could. Amanda just stood there, the gun in her hand, trained on me. Finally, Plant came back into the room. I've just decided what to do. We will leave you here for the night, Kent. With my hands and feet tied? Of course. Well, how do you expect me to get any sleep? Well, I don't. But I expect you to do a lot of thinking. About what? The pearls, naturally. I have a proposition for you. If in the morning you decide to turn them over to me, I'll give you your freedom. Even if I had the pearls, pal, what's your guarantee? <laughs> You'll have to trust me. Sleep on it, Mr. Kent. Uh, he had a marvelous sense of humor. I sat trussed up in the chair for hours, getting more and more uncomfortable by the minute. Then, just as a clock started chiming somewhere in the house, the living room door opened. <laughs> it was a good trick if somebody was trying to cover up the sound of the door. I didn't hear it open. I just saw it. Quiet, please. She had a knife in her hand. Because she said please, it looked like she wasn't going to cut my throat. But I wouldn't have been surprised if she did. I was surprised when she cut the ropes. Are you all right? Can you walk? Sweetheart, I can run. But why this? Never mind about that. We must get out of here. 
I'd rather stay and take care of Fatsy. Please, he may hear us any minute. I did want to take care of Plant, but something told me to get out of the place with Amanda. So we exited through one of the French windows. I'd left my car parked a few blocks away. We got in and drove off. Amanda, why the rescue? Don't you know? I've got an idea, but I'd like to hear you say it. Well, Larry, it's because I like you. <laughs> Come again, sweetheart. <laughs> Very well. This is another reason. I like nice things, too. Jewelry, furs, good living. Uh-huh. Doesn't plant supply you with that? To a certain extent. But he isn't in possession of the three black pearls. You are. Are you sure? Positive. Okay. Maybe I do have them. What comes next? There's a dealer in pearls now in Sydney. If we go to his office tonight, we can strike a bargain for more money than either of us has ever seen. Who is this dealer? Someone I know. I know many important people. Yeah, I don't doubt it. Well? Before I agree, Amanda, I've got to know the whole story, everything. Why? I'm curious. There's a nice, quiet coffee shop where we can talk. Very well. We went to a cafe off the main drag in Paddington. Amanda waited till two cups of coffee were set before us and the waitress was out of earshot. All right, Larry. What is it you want to know? How did Yarkas and the thug I had to knock off come into the picture with Plant and you? Yarkas knew Plant. He came and told him about the pearls your friend brought to Sydney. Why? Well, they made a deal. Plant and some of his men would help Yarkas get the pearls. Why didn't Yarkas get them himself? He was a coward. Yet he was the one who knifed Bill Kerr, wasn't he? Yes, but Plant was there in the room, holding a gun on Kerr. Uh-huh. After he was killed, they searched the room. But, of course, the pearls weren't there. How did I get tied up with it? Yarkas followed Kerr to the Federal Building. Then later, when you went to Kerr's hotel room, one of Plant's men was waiting. He recognized you. And almost let me have it. Yeah, I got the whole picture now. When Plant found out Kerr had been to my office, he figured I had the pearls, so he sent you along as a decoy, huh? Exactly. Are you satisfied now, Larry? Yeah. Yeah, I'm satisfied. Then shall we get the pearls? First, what happens after we sell them? You should know. There are lots of places where two people can travel together when they have money. Hmm. That sounds like a good idea. Come on. Let's go. I took Amanda to my block of flats. We went down into the cellar. I'd hidden the chamois bag of pearls on top of a rafter. They were still there. Amanda's eyes were wide when I showed her the bag. Let me, Larry. Let me look at them. I went under the electric light bulb and gently shook the pearls into my hand. Oh, they're beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Very expensive. They've already cost four lives. They're worth it. I put them back into the bag and we went out to my car. Amanda told me to drive to Circular Key. When we got there, she gave directions that took us along the waterfront. She told me to stop before a warehouse that had a weak light shining at the bottom of a wooden flight of steps. We went up the stairs. Amanda first. At the top, there was a wooden door. She knocked. That's our prearranged signal. He's expecting me. I heard the soft click of a light switch from behind the door. Light shone through the cracks. It's all right. He's waiting. I leaned forward, turned the doorknob. 
and then things happen almost too fast to follow. As I kicked the door open, I grabbed Amanda and held her in front of me. He'd been expecting us all right, it was Plant. The shot he fired was stopped by Amanda. And Plant, he just stood there, his mouth wide open. I kept Amanda in front of me. She was dead. Amanda. She'll have trouble answering you, Plant. Amanda. I didn't know what to do. He still had the gun and he was standing there. And then... He did a very strange thing. He dropped his gun... and came forward. I let him take Amanda from me. He placed her on the floor gently. And then he kissed her. It was very romantic. He didn't seem to know I was there. I went out through the door, and as I walked away, I heard what I was waiting for. Good night.